Imagine a fence post your great-grandkids could still use. Medieval builders figured that out centuries ago. Your wooden deck, your garden fence, your shed. If you're lucky, they last a decade before rot, insects, and warping start tearing them apart. Most people accept that as normal. You paint, you stain, maybe you buy pressure-treated lumber that smells like chemicals and still fails sooner than you'd like. Meanwhile, scattered across Europe and beyond, there are medieval churches, barns, piers, and pieces of furniture made of nothing but ordinary wood, still standing, still doing their job, still structurally sound after centuries of rain, frost, and use. How did they do it? The answer isn't a single magic product. It's a set of decisions that start before the tree is even cut and continue through seasoning, shaping, and finishing. Medieval carpenters treated wood less like a disposable building material and more like a living partner with its own rules. They learned those rules the hard way, through collapsed roofs, rotten pilings, split beams, and then passed the lessons down through strict guild traditions and apprenticeships that lasted years. The result was wood that could shrug off centuries of punishment while our modern boards crumble in a couple of winters. It begins in the forest, long before the first tool touches the tree. One of the most important medieval tricks for rot-resistant wood was timing. Trees were not cut whenever it was convenient. They were felled when the tree itself was least prepared to grow. Craftsmen preferred winter felling, especially late winter, when the sap was low, growth had paused, and the tree's internal moisture and sugar content were at their minimum. To them, this was just the right time, according to tradition. Modern science can now explain why it mattered. Less sugar and moisture in the wood means less food and less water for fungi and insects that cause decay. Starting with cleaner, drier timber gave them a massive advantage before any finish or joinery entered the picture. Selection was just as important as timing. Medieval builders knew their species. Oak wasn't just strong. It had natural tannins that made it harder for fungi and many wood-boring insects to thrive. Dense, slow-grown timbers with tight growth rings were prized because their compact structure resisted splitting and water movement. When a carpenter rejected a log because the grain wasn't straight enough or because the tree grew too fast in rich soil, he wasn't being picky for aesthetics alone. He was thinking decades ahead to a future in which that piece of wood might be the difference between a roof standing or collapsing under snow. Once the tree was cut, Medieval preservation took an even stranger turn. Today, the idea of keeping wood dry is drilled into every DIYer's head. But some of the most rot-resistant medieval timber spent its early life underwater. Certain carpenters and shipbuilders practiced what's now called water seasoning. After felling, logs were chained together and sunk in rivers, lakes, or harbor basins for months or even years. To a modern mind, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. Wet wood is supposed to rot, right? Yet this soaked timber often proved remarkably durable. The key lies in what happens inside the wood. Submerged, away from oxygen, fungal decay slows dramatically. At the same time, sugars and other soluble compounds leach out into the water. Tiny pockets of air are flushed out. And when the log is finally hauled up and slowly air-dried, it becomes denser, more stable, and less appetizing to the organisms that normally chew through wood. Think of it as a deep cleaning and a reset of the wood's internal chemistry. Venice's famous wooden foundations, sitting submerged for centuries, and certain northern European timbers show exactly how effective this counterintuitive process can be. Not every region used long-term immersion, but almost everywhere you find the same next step. Patience. 
after felling, or after time in water, wood was not rushed into service. Medieval carpenters understood that green wood, full of water, moves and cracks as it dries. They also noticed that slowly dried wood, stacked properly and given years, behaves differently from wood force dry in days or weeks. So they built seasoning sheds, open-sided structures that let air move freely but kept rain off. Boards and beams were stacked on raised supports to keep them off the damp ground, separated by small stickers, thin strips that allowed air to circulate around every face. A one-inch board might season for a year. Thicker stock could sit for multiple years. An apprentice's life included a lot of moving, stacking, and checking wood that would only be used long after he had learned more advanced skills. This slow seasoning did more than just dry the wood. It allowed internal stresses to relax gradually, reducing warping and splitting. It gave fungi less of a foothold because moisture was leaving steadily, not trapped behind a hard surface coating. A seasoned beam stored indoors or under cover might hover at a moisture level low enough that rot organisms could never really get going. Today, we often trap moisture inside wood with plastic-like finishes and rapid drying. Medieval builders let nature do the work, aligning their schedule with the wood's own pace. If careful selection, timing, soaking, and seasoning prepared the wood to resist rot from the inside, the next layer of protection came from what they put on and into the surface. Modern wood protection is usually about sealing, paints, varnishes, and synthetic sealers that try to create an impermeable skin. Medieval craftsmen often chose the opposite approach. Instead of building a rigid shell on top, they fed the wood with liquids that soaked deep into its fibers, then solidified or bonded there. One of the most powerful tools in this arsenal was tar, especially pine tar, combined with natural oils. This approach was popular among Vikings, shipwrights, and later medieval builders. Tar produced from pine contains a complex mix of resins and natural biocides. When warmed and brushed onto wood, it penetrated deeply, filling pores and coating cell walls. Unlike a thin paint film, tar stayed flexible and adhered tenaciously. It repelled water, but allowed the wood to breathe, so moisture inside could still escape instead of being trapped. One of the key reasons many modern coatings actually accelerate rot when they fail. For exposed surfaces like ship planks, harbor posts, roofs, and external beams, tar-based treatments could extend life dramatically, especially when periodically refreshed. Archaeologically, Tar-treated timbers and charred and tarred posts have been found in conditions that would have destroyed untreated wood long ago. Fire itself was another preservation tool. Controlled charring, lightly scorching the surface of wood, creates a thin layer of carbonized material that insects and fungi don't particularly enjoy. Done properly, it also seals some of the wood's surface pores slows water absorption, and makes the outer fibers less likely to swell and shrink. In Japan, a similar technique known as yakisugi or shusugi ban became famous, but medieval Europeans also used smoking and light charring to protect vulnerable parts of structures. Posts that would go into the ground, lower sections of exterior cladding, and even certain tools might be smoked or briefly passed over flame. The smartest builders did not stop at charring. They followed fire with tar or oil, letting the blackened surface soak up protective liquids like a sponge. The char layer helped hold the tar. The tar soaked into fibers newly opened by heat. The combination produced wood that resisted moisture and decay in a way that plain, untreated lumber simply could not. You can still see proof in some medieval stave churches and harbor structures where treated timbers, exposed to weather for hundreds of years, remain sound 
while later additions around them have failed. Where tar was rare or expensive, other natural treatments took its place. Boiled linseed oil, derived from flax seeds, was a workhorse finish. Unlike many modern film-forming products, boiled linseed oil penetrates deeply and then polymerizes, hardens, inside the wood itself. Medieval and later craftsmen often combined it with beeswax. First, the oil soaked in, carrying with it pigments or subtle fungicidal agents from plants and minerals. Then, a layer of wax was applied and buffed. The wax created a watershedding surface that was still microporous, allowing vapor to pass. The result was a flexible system, oil hardening within, wax renewing on top, both compatible with future maintenance. Furniture, paneling, and finer interior woodwork treated this way often survived. Hard use with only periodic refreshes. Animal fats were another option, especially for peasants and working households. Tallow from cattle or sheep could be heated and brushed onto wooden tools, handles, doors, and farm structures. Craftsmen learned to upgrade simple fat by mixing in fine charcoal dust and alkaline ash, creating a kind of early protective compound. The fat repelled water and gave a degree of lubrication. The charcoal and ash deterred insects and altered surface chemistry in ways unfriendly to decay. Archaeological and historical evidence suggests that even relatively low-status wooden objects treated this way often outlasted untreated ones by decades. Some sources even describe acidic treatments, like soaking wood in vinegar before oiling or waxing. The idea seems odd at first but acid can help clean wood deeply, killing mold spores and discouraging some insects. When followed by a penetrating oil or tar, it forms part of a multi-step defense, clean or then seal. The theme keeps repeating. Medieval preservation rarely relied on a single layer. It was always a stack of small advantages. All of this would have been wasted if the wood had been assembled with weak, failure-prone joints that opened up gaps for water. That leads to another often overlooked factor in medieval wood longevity, joinery. Rot loves trapped moisture and stagnant pockets. Sloppy joints and metal fasteners that concentrate stress are perfect for that. Medieval carpenters, especially in guild contexts, use joinery that both protected the interior of the wood and squeezed parts together more tightly as the material aged. One of the most brilliant examples is drawboard mortise and tenon joinery. In this technique, a tenon, the projecting tongue of one piece of wood, fits into a mortise, a slot in another. Through both pieces, the carpenter drills offset holes. A wooden peg is then driven through. Because the holes are slightly misaligned, the peg pulls the joint together under constant tension. Over time, as the wood shrinks and moves, the stored tension keeps the joint tight instead of letting it wiggle loose. No metal screws to rust, no wide, breathing gaps to suck in water and hold it. The joint itself becomes a long-term defense against rot simply by excluding the conditions rot needs. Many medieval doors, chests, and frames built this way are still solid despite centuries of movement and load. Zoom out, and a pattern emerges. Medieval wood that lasted for centuries wasn't just old wood. It was the product of a system where every stage was tuned for longevity, choosing species with natural resistance and cutting them at the right time of year. Using immersion and slow seasoning to strip out sugars, stabilize moisture, and relax internal stress. Applying penetrating natural finishes, tar, oil, fat, wax, designed to move into the wood, not just sit on top. Using controlled fire and smoke to create protective surfaces that repel water and pests. Building joints that get tighter over time 
and shed water instead of collecting it. Medieval builders understood that where you put wood mattered just as much as how you treated it. Exterior beams were often lifted off the ground with stone foundations or plinths, keeping the vulnerable end grain out of constant contact with damp soil. Roof overhangs were generous, throwing water well clear of walls. Drainage paths were considered, even in simple barns, so that runoff didn't cascade over the same wooden faces year after year. In harbors and wet areas, the parts of posts most likely to rot, the zone just at and below soil or water level, got extra attention, sometimes with charring and tar or with sacrificial wraps that could be replaced. The goal wasn't perfection. They accepted that some pieces would eventually fail. But by combining smarter placement, better drainage, and robust treatments, they pushed that failure so far into the future that it might as well belong to a different generation. All of this raises a practical question. What can a curious, analytical, slightly nostalgic person do with these medieval tricks today? You probably don't own a medieval forest or a river for seasoning, but the principles scale down beautifully. If you're selecting wood for an outdoor project, you can favor naturally durable species with tighter growth rings. You can buy or cut lumber in the cold season when possible, or at least select material that has been air-dried, not just kiln-flashed. You can stack and rest boards in a sheltered space before building, letting them adjust gradually instead of locking their movements into a rigid structure on day one. When it comes to finishes, you can shift your mindset from sealing to feeding. Penetrating oils, natural tar products, or oil and wax combinations that soak in and harden within the fibers will generally give more forgiving, longer-lasting protection than a brittle, impermeable film. Where safe and appropriate, light charring followed by an oil or tar treatment can turn vulnerable surfaces, especially ground contact posts and lower cladding, into something much more resistant. You can design joints and details that shed water instead of catching it and avoid trapping moisture behind non-breathable coatings. And perhaps most importantly, you can borrow the medieval attitude toward time. Accept that good woodwork is not instant. The wood itself needs a journey. From forest, through seasoning, through treatment, before it is truly ready. That journey is where rot resistance is built in, long before the first raindrop falls. The medievals didn't keep wood from rotting by accident or with a single miracle substance. They kept it alive by aligning their methods with the material, step by step. They worked with sap cycles, with water, with fire, with natural oils and resins, and with joinery that respected the way wood moves. The result is still visible wherever a centuries-old beam or carved chest stands quietly doing its job while our factory-made furniture and chemically-treated lumber crack, peel, and sag in a few short years. If you've ever felt that modern stuff just doesn't last like they used to make it, you're not imagining things. Those medieval boards didn't just stand the test of time. They were engineered for it, using nothing more than patience, observation, and a handful of techniques you can still adapt today.